sorry we're starting a few minutes late here this afternoon. Thank you for joining the Pasco School Board of Directors for our study session this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Coordinated. We are going to discuss uh, 2018 levy planning. Um, as a reminder, this is an open public meeting and it is being recorded for uh, broadcast if you go to YouTube and look up Pasco Schools or watch uh, Charter TV Channel 191. You can see the broadcast of our study sessions and all of our uh, open public board meetings as well. Um, levy planning is a little bit different this year in that uh, the, the state uh, House Bill 2242, the impacts of that are not fully known, but we have uh, Mr. Howard Roberts here this afternoon to, to tell us what he knows about it, how it impacts the school district. And we also have uh, Mr. Jim McNeil here from Foster Pepper. Um, to as our bond council bond slash levy council to give us uh, more information from his side if we have any questions there. So we'll let uh, Mr. Robert start and um, we'll open it up for questions from the board after that. Thank you, President Lehrman, Superintendent Whitney, members of the board. Um, today I'm gonna be providing with you uh, some information about the replacement levy that the district anticipates putting before the voters in February of 2018. But as President Lehrman stated, in order to get there, I'm gonna to need to share some information about recent changes, major changes to the way states fund K-12 education. And what I wanna talk a little bit about what these changes mean for both the district and the taxpayers. Just a few things to keep in mind. There's lots of information here and there are several pieces of the new funding that are not abundantly clear. And so feel free to ask questions. You know, first here, and then if you come up with ones later, that's fine. We have another session in two weeks, three weeks, I guess it is, um, another study session. Um, so, you know, compile those questions if things come up or things you think about later. But feel free to ask questions as well today. So, just a planning calendar. Oops, that happened. Okay, we'll go one more. Planning calendar. Um, working backwards from the date of December 15th, 2017, which is when we have to have a resolution to Franklin County in order to put this levy on the ballot for February. So going backwards, um, we've got another study session uh, scheduled for November 14th and that can be followed by board action on the levy or levy resolution. Of course, we have a little bit of flexibility there as well. That just gives you a rough idea. So two, at least two sessions on this topic. Things we know about the levy, even with the changes. Again, L is for learning. Levy is not used to build schools. Still, good, That's a bond, still gonna use levies. It's one type of property taxes that, if approved by the voters of a district, are used to pay for education programs and services in the day-to-day -day operations of schools. Levies are collected over up to a four-year period. And when I speak of a year in levies, it's always hard to make this transition, but I'm speaking calendar year. So that's how the taxes run, as opposed to a, a fiscal year. So PASCO last approved a levy in February, <laughs> 2016 and that would be for the calendar years 17 and 18. So this levy under consideration is not a new tax. It will replace the current levy which expires at the end of calendar 2018. Simple majority is required for approval of a levy and a district has two tries to pass a levy and this is one of the reasons why most districts uh, put a levy in February because they've got other dates available and then the rest of that calendar year to pass a le to go at it for a second try. Um, if you did that in November, you really wouldn't have that option. Oops. So the major changes of school funding for districts can be broken down in three different areas. This is right from the actual language of 2242. Main purposes are to increase the state salary allocation. This is a big ticket dollar amount. It's kind of the, the latest and largest piece to that quest to fully fund education. It's attempt to more or less to cl more closely align state funding for salaries to what it actually costs saying it's an attempt and it, 
it's that. So um, second of all, there's a change with this law in the mix of state and local funding. More funding is moving to the state level and there's some, obviously some pros about that and some things to consider on the other side as well. With that shift to the state, more funding responsibility comes more requirements in the terms of transparency and accountability. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that this time because I think we have enough in the first two, but I will save that for the next meeting as well. So let's look at how the funding will change. First, uh, funding for the state allocation. Currently for teachers, for example, you start with what's called the salary allocation uh, model or SAM. You take the lowest salary on that and you multiply it times a mix factor, which is kind of just a, an aggregate of all the district teachers' experience in education. The higher the mix factor, the, the, the more experience in education you have and the more funding you would receive, in other words, for that position. And of course that number varies from district to district based on the mix of experience and education. So that all changes starting next fiscal year. The, the salary allocation manual is done, or mod, model is done away with. So it's a mix factor. In, in their place, there's gonna be a single state average and, and that's gonna, it will only deviate by what's called the regionalization factor and in inflation. And I, I'm not gonna talk about regionalization unless we, we get to that point. But in other words, you have one average where before you had different averages based on how the district um, education experience of their teachers. So what that does in PASCO's case, I tried to give you an idea here, at full phase in, this is gonna be a two year process to get this in over two years, um, instructional staff are going to be funded at $64,000 um, plus inflation. Currently, as of the September apportionment or report, we were, we were receiving about 52, almost 53,000. You can see that's a significant increase in funding. Similar items for administrative staff, where it goes from where we're at 62 now to 95 and as well as classified staff. So again, large changes in the, in the staff funding. And again, just to remind you, that'll be phased in over two years, 18, 19, and 19, 20. And just like that allocation, now we're gonna switch to the payment side. With the salaries paid by districts are gonna be undergoing a change too. And it's also phased in over those same two years. But so after the transition year in 1819, here's the requirements that need to be in place by 1920. You can read those up there. There's like the size of the box, minimum is 40, maximum is 90,000. Again, this is for instructional staff. Um, within the box, there's, a, there's one line that after five years you get a 10% bump. And then kind of superimposed over the whole thing is the idea that if you teach in a certain subject, STEM, bilingual, or special education, a district may pay you up to 10% more than even that $90,000 if you teach those particular areas. It's up to the district as well, as I understand it. So to put all this together, one of the things OSPI has been tasked with is to put together a model salary grid that would take all these pieces into, you know, into consideration and they're supposed to have that out by December. Districts are not required to use it, it's just meant as a guide. It's all basically up to collective bargaining with the districts now. So, about levies. First of all, they're not maintenance and operations levies, or they're not called that anymore. They are renamed enrichment levies. And the term enrichment, as you can guess, has some connotations that already some districts are starting to say, hey, we don't, we don't really like that. It doesn't, doesn't sound right. So Mr. McNeil, as part of his presentation, will talk about some alternatives to that language for the ballot. Levies are, are going to be limited either by amount or by rate. For PASCO, the rate is gonna be the limiting factor and it's gonna be $1.50 per assessed value. There's gonna be restrictions on how those, those dollars can be used, those enrichment levy dollars. And basically the state says there has to be a documented and demonstrated enrichment of the state's statutory program of basic education. Well, what does that mean? 
a lot of people are still trying to figure it out, honestly. But there are some examples um, that you see up there. Um, if you have staff in excess of the staffing ratio that the state assigns, for I will just give you a quick example. For example, it, we've talked about this before. For levy purposes, the district feels it's important to have a nurse at pretty much every school. Well, the state funds us for a little over two nurses. So that would be considered, as my understanding, an enrichment activity if we, want, if we chose to fund those uh, additional nurses, which we are currently under our m and levy. Um, examples given in the state law language about staffing above the ratio or professional development. And then there's some specific activities that are called out in 2242, including extracurricular, extended school days or years, early learning, or a portion of the admin costs that could be assigned to overseeing any of these activities. Now, there's still stuff to be fleshed out about these, and as I understand, OSPI will be both reviewing and potentially adding new lists of what's considered enrichment. That's still yet to come. But in a, a little bit later in this presentation, I'm going to give you some ideas other than just the nursing of some areas where we have, um, we would have some enrichment activities that could be packaged together for a PASCO levy. So more state revenue, talked about that. What gives on the local side? Well, the levies and a little bit to levy uh, equalization are, is the answer here. So if you look at it from the taxpayer standpoint, there's going to be a number of changes over the next few years. Um, the current levy rate for this year is $4.27. And for right now, for simplification, we're going to assume that it's going to be about the same the following year. I think it'll drop, but I th we'll just say that. Um, so in 2018, it should be about that same amount. However, in 2018, we've got a new player. The state is going to have to pay for all this additional funding, and they're going to increase their, their portion of the school property tax. Should be about 89 cents. That's a change. I think your copy said 81. Mr. Christensen caught that, and I appreciate it. But it should be about 89 cents. Um, and so the following year, though, after you add that in, you go up a little high. The following year, PASCO is capped at $1.50. So you see things go back down. So you can imagine this roller coaster effect is, is going to be on the rates for the next few years, and it's going to take everybody's patience to kind of explain what's going on. I put it together on a little example to kind of show you the same thing I was just talking about. It's a very simplified example, and it's got a lot of estimates. The only actual line is the first one going across, and you can see the state levy piece for calendar 17, local levy existing bonds, and that's a combined rate of 861. The second year, in 18, we do add that um, 89 cents in the first column to the state levy. The SUMAR stays the same. The existing bonds stay the same. And let's assume that we pass the pending 2017 bond, we'll get to 1009. That'll be the high water mark. The following year, the only real change is that the district's rate gets capped at $1.50, and you'll see we drop down to $7.32. So over the two years when the dust settles, you're actually going to go down about $1.29. Um, and that's even with the state increasing their portion of the tax and with uh, assuming passage of the bond at 59 cents per thousand. And of course, this is all dependent on assessed value changes, which you have to estimate. And I can tell you, like I do on other things, this is going to be wrong as soon as I find out what assessed values are. But this just gives you an idea of the concept. So now to the, to the local side. And I'm going to talk a little bit about local effort assistance. They really use that name now instead of levy equalization, so I'm going to try to train myself here. So local effort assistance is still in play after 2242. Um, it still interacts with levy, but the calculation is changing some. And it's more dependent on the number of students that, you've, that you have. And the LEA, local effort assistance, is intended to ensure that all districts have access to a statewide local effort threshold 
of $1,500 per student. Everything's going to be based on, that's going to be the box that you work in, whether it's levy or levy equalization. So how does that work? Well, I said before, maximum levy amount, which is a key term here, maximum levy amount, is the lesser of, I said $1.50 per thousand, because for our district that had generated about $9.4 million, or $2,500 per pupil, which would generate about $43.5 million. We're not going to be eligible for that, so we're going to fall under the first category. Our limit is going to be the, the rate at $1.50. And any money you raise from local effort assistance is categorized in the same bucket as levy dollars. It has to be used for enrichment. So for PASCO, I made some estimates to kind of get us here, and this is for 2019, so I'm going a couple years ahead of time. Let's see how this works. So if we have $1.50, and we have an assessed value estimate of 6.3 million. We've got to divide that by a thousand. A dollar fifty is about 9.5 million, roughly. That would be the levy we could generate in calendar year 2019 under this new, uh, the new formula. The local effort assistance, you're going to take that mat, that 1,500 or 1,500 dollars per student which I've got students at 1739, so that's about $26 million, less your maximum levy amount. And in this case, I've assumed that we're levying the maximum amount. You have choices there. But if we do levy the maximum that's $26 million less, $9.5 million gets to, to about $16.6 million in levy equalization or local effort assistance. So the total between the two is $26 million. And that's kind of convenient because if you work it back the other way, that works right to that threshold. If you take $1,500 per student times that, the number of students, you're going to get to $26 million. So it's the outside box and the levy and the levy equalization have to fit in that total. So a couple of caveats. Same as the old rules, if a district does not successfully levy or is is not choosing to levy, there is no local effort assistance. If a district levies less than the maximum levy amount, that $1.50 per assessed value, the local effort assistance is reduced proportionately. Just trying to put some numbers on these assumptions, I calculate a, for every one cent reduction, it would cost about $163,000, and that says in LEA revenue, that's levy and LEA revenue both. So the total of six, 26 million from the local sources, levy generated money is about $15 million less than what we're currently expecting to get in 2017. Just to give you an idea. So that's what gives, there's more state funding, but we're seeing a loss there on the local side. Howard. Yes. So th this would say that we're guaranteed in, with a combination of LEA and our local funds, um, $1,500 total per student regardless of our assessed value. How does the, uh, you know, here we have pretty stable, or we've had in the past pretty stable property um, assessments, um, and as, as those assessments go up, it looks like um, our state money might go down. But how would the state balance this? Um, I know it's hard for people to comprehend now, but like in 2008, in some of these higher assessed areas where the property value could dip 30, 40 percent, not just in value, but right. actually when they go reassess, I, I saw that where I lived in the past, uh -huh. that it went down 30, 40 percent. The state would be on the hook for quite a bit more money, right, um, in that case for those districts. Yeah, it, again, how, it depends how on how their doing? enrollment's doing. You know, if their enrollment's declining too, that's going to make the box small. Yeah, but if you kept the same enrollment in some right. of these high set uh, multiple highly assessed values in the right. district right now drop by 30 40 percent that's a huge impact yes. to the state contribution yes did You're they right. talk about that at all, or do you know? I, I haven't do heard you? any talk about that, but I, I think you're absolutely right, because uh, what's going to happen is your, your assessed, your LEA piece is going to really Skyrocket pick up. there, yeah. Yeah, you're going to be capped at that $1.50, no matter how low your assessed value goes. And yeah, that's going to cost so some. So even if our property values went in the tank, this state wouldn't be on the hook for us more than you know, right. 16 million, but there's other districts where they could be on the hook for a lot. 
And other districts may have that other limiting factor, which is another whole consideration. They may be the ones that are at 2,500 per student is their limit too. I, and I haven't thought through all of that. I'm still stuck on the dollar fifty for Pasco, but there could be other limiting factors for districts as well. Yeah. Just something for us to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it wouldn't impact us, but I'm just wondering if there was a huge shortfall, you know, because of circumstances like that. If I think as long as we levied the maximum, I think we wouldn't see a shortfall because as long as levy equals or local effort assistance in place, it's supposed to pick up that difference. Yeah. Now, I will say that in the past, since I've been here in eight years, I've heard levy equalization or local effort assistance being talked about as a bargaining chip more than once, which is a little bit discouraging. So, question, other questions? Okay. All right. So, that gets us through that part. The about $15 million less than 2017 yeah. revenue from levy, the levy and equalization? Yes. <clears throat> That's just what we brought, bring in, correct? The state is, if we do the levy equalization, we'll end up in the positive, not the negative. Yeah, there's going to be, I'll show you on the next okay. slide, but there's a there's a net deal. Because you really want to know what's the total funding going to look like yeah. yep. for all pieces. And, I, and I'm going to say, so there's a lot more money in in, in um, state allocations, but we're taking just what you said, that $15 million hit, so how does that balance out? And I will tell you that I believe, and for what I've seen every model that we've run, that we're gonna come out with a net increase in total revenue. Now, in court, important to factors for this is remember a lot of this is program dollars very specific for CTE lap and bilingual we've also got some additional state funding for professional days they're going to add one a year starting I believe next year and those pieces with the increased salary allocation and the associated taxes and benefits will more than offset the losses in the levy and levy equalization um, it will transfer more of that funding responsibility in other words to the state but it's still going to mean that we're really, it's really important to have the local funds as well. Howard, can you correct me if I'm wrong? That's at full implementation, correct? That's not necessarily correct. the context over this phase in period. Correct. Correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's right. And the next, the next slide is, okay, I used OSPI's estimator tool, which they've released earlier in November. And there are a number of tools out there using various assumptions and focusing on different parts of the funding changes. From my perspective, from what I've been able to see, OSPI seems like the most comprehensive approach. There are some things that we need to talk about with it, but here's the estimated increase and decrease in key categories of revenue over the next three years. The first one I'll call compensation related. Those are dollars that are for the salary allocation um, portion of things and, and or cost of living because you see in 17, 18 there's some dollars there and we did not receive more money for you know just the compensation. We did receive a 2.3 percent cost of living. But across you can see how those things pick up for compensated relate, related dollars. In 2018 that's when the first half year of that major increase comes in and in 1920 the second half year. Told you it was funded over two sessions. And then you can see in 2021, it just pretty much flattens out. And there's, a, there's an inflation kicker, but that's pretty much it. Categorical programs, we talked about these during the budget session, and actually it was around $5 million between LAP and bilingual and CTE. Those are all things that are very targeted. Those add quite a few dollars across, as you can see. And then you can see local effort assistance and MO slash enhancement levy. We're going to use the same line for both of them. And they're negative numbers. And they're not so much negative in the first year, 2018 19, but in 2019 20, when we're in our first full year, remember those are calendar years, full year of being capped at $1.50, you're going to see, again, a drop of about 16 million by that point, 15, 16 million. So when you put all those together, you get net changes, and that may be a little bit misleading because, again, that includes program dollars that are very specific, and 
you know, but it is just designed to give you a feel for what's out there and, and how it pretty much, it, it jumps substantially in 1819 and then in 1920 and then levels out. And I tried to capture that with the graph as well. It's not one cumulative drop of money. You can see how it comes in over, over time, over four years in this case. So Howard, um, $64,000 the fund for a teacher for a yeah okay and we if we use a round number and say we have a thousand teachers that's 64 million dollars um what are they and do i understand right that right now they're funding funding us at fifty two thousand fifty two thousand dollars per year it's about eleven thousand more per teacher so is it is that Oh, 11,000 times 1,000, yeah. that's the difference in what will be required to pay out of that 24 million there? No, we won't be required to pay that. Um, okay, th that's the funding. And that's where it gets tricky. I know this is hard to understand, but this is the funding. They fund us at a certain level, now they're gonna fund us at 11,000 more per unit from that point forward. And so it's been one of the contentions of the, you know, uh, the litigation that the state needs to bear a bigger cost of funding teachers. So even if the teachers were not going to change their salaries at all, the state would send more funding our way. Okay. So that $24,357,000 in 2019-20, that's a combination of the additional monies that we'll get for administration, teachers, so about 11, let's say 11 million of that's for te additional money for teachers if we said we have a thousand teachers and we get $11,000 more per teacher, so 11 of that is additional teacher funding. We can use it how we want and, and a, a portion of that 24 million is administrative funding and then a portion of that is the other. The classified. The classified. Right. So those three pieces right there add up yeah. to the 24 million is well it, 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 it would be nice but it's it's close because the state doesn't there the state only funds to a certain ratio right so they only fund about I want to say a little more than 800 of our teachers for example okay and the it's the same way with our admin and our classified staff too um, that they they aren't funding those pieces and that's generally why we run a levy too that's another piece that we pick up through the levy as I mentioned with the nurse but for teachers, it's a lot bigger kind of idea. So there's there's two pieces. The salary itself hasn't been fully funded, and then there's positions, whole positions that are just not have never been picked up by the state. And whether you think one less than one psychologist is enough for the whole district, that's what the state's funding right now. So those are the kind of things we deal with. So that but that 24 million equals the difference between what they fund now for instructional staff and what they're going to fund for the number of staff that they do fund. The eligible. And administrative staff now right. versus then and classified staff now versus Correct. then. That, okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Roberts, I'm, I'm kind of thinking the same way. So you have that this massive increase in compensation and categorical and programs, but then we're going to have a decrease in our levy or enrichment levy, whatever you want to call it. But the compensation related is pretty much all going to be directed, obviously, a comp compensation of teachers, staff, administrators, uh, classified personnel. The categorical and programs we could essentially view as what's happening in the school, the programs that we previously used some of that levy for, that's going to kind of take the place of that. Would that be accurate? And then maybe not directly, maybe, but... Maybe not in that case, but yeah. Not, I, not in every I, case, but yeah. in general, we... we you know, this year we had, say, 37 million. We're going to, in two years, it's only going to be 23 from the local, but we get an extra 16 million from the, sti the state. So it essentially, and then goes to, to towards programs again. I, I think even though we, no one's going to hold us to numbers because these are all formulas and models and, and they haven't even decided, but we're just trying to get an idea of what the plan is and, and just to get an idea. And so that kind of gives us a sense, at least in my mind, of what, what this, all this money and what the change in money is happening. Yeah. So to claim, as some people have, that we're going to get you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars and that we can just go build schools with that is absolutely dishonest, reckless, outrageous. Okay, this is specifically 
stated in their bills that this is going to be compensation related funding and categorical and programs. Our local reliance is going to be less and then they're going to give us more money to for these programs, STEM, bilingual, all these things, different um, programs at the schools and they're going to better fund our salaries and that's where the majority of the money goes. It, it's absolutely dishonest to say that, that we're going to have this huge windfall of money to build schools. Is yeah. that would that be accurate? I, I, I would say you've got to be really careful, like you're saying, because it, like everything else, it has strings attached and different colored money. And if you were to take that program categorical line out of each of those totals at the bottom, you can see there's not a lot of other money you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because that categorical money, for example, with LAP, you get, it's designed to give you so many more hours per week with a student, you know, and things we can't. In order to get that money, we've got to do that. So we do have to incur costs from that. That's not a, and that's not something else you're going to pick up. So, and I think that's the same with bilingual. You know, there's a couple of those that are very specific about here's what you use the money for. So, another way to look at it might be to take that program line out of it altogether, and you you get down to a lot yeah, less. So it's just, what you're saying is that we may not even get all that money if we're not using. It. I mean, it's not just they don't hand us a check for ten million dollars and say right. do what you want. Maybe increase some of your administrative salaries because you're real happy with that and. Yeah. And you know, we increase our financial officers. It's, yeah. it's a lot of those. If you don't have the program, if you're not doing that, then you don't get that money. There's yeah. going to be greater accountability and transparency. And this is the money that's going to this. If you don't have that program set up, uh, or that that number of dual language, you don't get that money. Right. Right. It's almost like you have to spend it to get it. In that case, I mean, it's almost like that. So, but it's good. It's a good thought, and they're very good ideas to where to spend those dollars, the targeted dollars. So I don't mean to slam it too much, but it does make it, it does restrict some of your options and what you can do. So let's see. So again, just to recap, for the 2019 calendar year, I, I would use these estimates right now, and they will probably change again too. It's based on an assumption. but. And again, the two caveats, as I mentioned here, but it's about $26 million. And here, as I promised, here's some potential uses that the district spends now that would seem to qualify as enrichment per the definitions that are laid out in 2242. And there's broad categories here. Staffing beyond the prototypical model. I picked up a few, some of the more expensive ones, and you can see that, and especially under teachers and teaching assistants, we have we have quite a few. I mean, we've got, we've got, um, the state really doesn't fund a lot of these, especially the teaching assistants, especially teachers in certain situations. And you can see that specialists like facilitators, coaches, et cetera, are not directly called out either. Um, so, and then of course, extracurricular activities, which we kind of remember, at least when I was a kid, this is what you associated a, a levy with. And here's some of the dollar amounts that we've spent uh, the last year, have budgeted for this year in those two areas, the, and professional development as well. These are things, as I understand, and I'm just grabbing a list, it's, as it says, non-exhaustive. There's just some ideas there that would seem to qualify for enrichment levy. Another question to think about is the length of the levy. Now you have a dollar fifty that you're restricted to, and it's not going to change that dollar fifty. How long should the term be then for a levy? You know, we we've done two years, and you know we're all very familiar with that. We're and that's a very consistent way to do things um, with the past practice. But if the levy rate remains unchanged, you could kind of skip a levy election in the middle of this, right? If you went four years, which is, you know, 100,000 plus, 110 or so. There's also a new requirement that I'm not going to talk about here, but starting next year, the district has to submit along with their budget kind of a four-year look ahead. <coughs> to me, this may line up with a four-year look ahead, you know, to have a four-year levy as well. Um, Again, the, the cons of this, it's not consistent. Everybody is used to two years, you know, and things. And there is, as we mentioned, you can hear it all through this presentation, some good deal of uncertainty out there. So do you really want to go out four years in that kind of environment? So that's, that's that conversation. But if we were to go to a four year, I wanted to at least give you an example. This is only meant to be an example. It isn't what I'm recommending, because we're not at that point right now at all. 
But let's just say that assessed value in that first row was just like we've been talking about. You can see the levy amount, the LEA amount, 26 million. I'm going to assume down here that the, the assessed value is going to grow at 6%. And you're going, wow, that's pretty high. That's, this is where it gets a little tricky. You really want to go a little higher on your estimate, um, aggressive amount. And there's two reasons. One is if you go low on your assessed valuation and the amount legally levied, if that $1.50 comes out higher, you can't recapture that difference. It's, you know, you take what you said you were going to levy at the $1.50. And second of all, if you remember, if you estimate that amount low and the assessed value grows through the roof, it's actually going to force that rate, and I can explain this, down below $1.50. And if you remember, that's one of the problems with LEA now. If it forces you below your maximum rate, say $1.47 instead of $1.50, just because you undershot your assessed value, you're going to lose a lot more money there than you would you know, money on the levy side. So something to keep in mind um, as you kind of go through this. But I would point out the interesting part of this whole thing. If you look at the far right-hand column for 2019 through 22, you see that we're staying at about 26 million all the way through. The pieces inside the box are going to change. In the levy amount column, you see the levy kind of steadily creeping up because we've got 6% a year. We're getting a lot of growth. But that just turns the mechanism and it shuts off the local effort assistance. And the reason that that last one is staying right at 26 million is because we're having enrollment at only 1%. Remember, enrollment is 2,500 per student is what drives that whole number. So I guess what I wanted to say from this, this is what a four-year levy could look like. The amount that we would be sending to the treasurer or the, the county would be that amount that says levy amount. That's what they're going to collect. They can't collect. And Jim will, I'm going to let Jim talk about this a little bit more. They can't collect $1.50 from each person. That's not how the rate, the rate structure works for the county. They're going to have to collect an amount for the district or every other taxing entity. Can, can I repeat what I heard to make sure I fully understand? Yeah. Using the 2019 value as an example, if we undershot, we're going to say it's 6.3 million right now, or six, right. sorry, 6.3 billion. If for some reason our assessed value skyrocketed to $8 billion, right. we're not going to still be able to charge $1.50 per no. thousand because we're not running really at $1.50 per thousand. We're running the set levy amount of 9.4 9. 9. million. million. Exactly. So now when we go and run our, or when we go and actually collect money, we're collecting it, I'm making up a number, $1.40. Right. The state is now not only are we losing that ten that that ten cents per thousand here, but the state will now prorate and not give us the entire portion of our twenty six million dollars. So we would maybe only collect a fraction of that twenty six yeah, million like in total. Almost seven percent you'd lose in like So we'd lose seven percent like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now can we run a four year levy but actually Guess. I mean, it's a very highly educated guess based on assessed value that and change the rate uh, each year. Can we say, well, this year, the first year is going to be this rate? Because obviously, what you're balancing is the cost of running a new levy, the promotion of a new levy, the risk that the levy doesn't pass, with trying to get a more exact number to what our total. Uh, amount will be right. So, mm -hmm. if you're gonna, uh, based on, and I appreciate what President Lerman said. That's I, that's a good explanation of, good. of how we. If we're off, it could mess up, and we could get hundreds of thousands of dollars off, or even more if it jumps by a, a large amount. So, can we set a for? But to me, it's like setting for it. That's a good idea because the, it's just so much work to just run this constantly and constantly explain, and mm -hmm. and then the cost of running it, and and all of those things. So, is there a way that we can use the best estimate we can mm -hmm. and actually run a different rate each year of the four years? Yeah, I don't know if it would be a different rate, but it would be a different assessed value. We take the dollar fifty times whatever we elevate the assessed and not, value not the rate work. Well, wait, yeah. set, or the levy amount then the, the levy amount can correct. we set a different levy amount as yes. you know even though because again you're not sure what the so if you overshot it how would that work if it, if that equals out to dollar 51 obviously we wouldn't be able to do it but do you know what i mean yeah so, it's kind of forced us to play the game of putting it up here but do you really want to put your budget based on that number maybe not not in two years you want to you know you want to be real careful about those because you may not achieve that high of a assessed value but 
it's balanced against what do you leave behind if you don't have it up there, especially in levy local effort assistance. So this is the way we, we do it now. We've done it. We, we set a dollar value set a dollar. for each year. And in, I believe, two years ago when we were doing this, or historically, we were at about $4.50. Mm -hmm. But because of in, the increase in the assessed value, our, our levy rate now is four twenty seven. That's an example of what has happened. Yes. What would happen exactly uh, in this case so in that case if we we set a dollar amount it passes it goes up it goes down that's the dollar amount we get correct in this case we set a dollar amount and our uh, we uh, project a six percent growth it increases by three percent mm -hmm. our rate technically would be over a dollar fifty correct do we know what happens then? It can't go over dollar fifty. Well, that's my understanding. Is it's a penalty cap. Does the state come back and, and adjust it for you, or is yeah, yeah, the county will. The county so will. Really so, yeah. yeah. So why why would anybody? I don't you know. know. Dollar <laughs> fifty. Why would you? I mean, if that was your target, why yeah. would you not <laughs> be very conservative and say, "Wow, our community is really going to grow." Yeah. There's no risk there. If, if no, and the taxpayer won't. It's a dollar fifty either way. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I don't know. So that's a key difference. A key difference here is that, like uh, Mr. Christensen said in the past, our actual value that we're collecting might go down as assessed values go up. With this one, it's going to be a dollar fifty no matter what. Yeah. If well, if, if assessed values skyrocket, it's still going to be a dollar fifty or less. It will never get more than a dollar fifty because right. your example where it skyrocketed, it could force it down. To a dollar forty-seven or something. Like I think that. they'd still charge us a dollar fifty, and the state would just contribute less. No, they do the dollar forty-seven. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Because so, have so that it. that equivalent levy amount is also a locked value. Yes. Still, it doesn't. That matter. is the locked value. You're exactly right. Even though the dollar fifty figures prominently, because it's a limit, as I understand, for situations where you go way low. I mean, where you, you <laughs> insert situations. You can, you can go lower than that rate, depending on what the levy amount you're asking for. Again, is this something that needs to be questioned? Because none of this is final yet, right? I mean, this hasn't, it's not in the final approved, it's gonna happen on this date, so maybe this is something, feedback we need to give that, okay, what, what does happen if we go above that? Because again, this is a game. So if we overshoot, undershoot, um, that's an important thing for the state to be clear about so that we, you know, that if they want us to play some game, we don't want to met, shoot ourselves in the foot by doing it incorrectly. And so they need to decide and, you know what I mean? If, yeah. if it's not fine, no, this is our best guess right now, but that's a good question to ask. What's, is there a penalty if we sure Mr. McNeil can enlighten yeah, us on this. I, 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 I'm going to let Jim go ahead anyway for right now. I can come back, but I, I think Jim's got another piece he wants to talk about. And I'll turn that Thank you. My, the slide on later. Uh, good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'd like to do is just answer a couple of questions. Generally what's gonna happen on, in a situation where you have estimated high on your amounts you're gonna collect, it will be rolled back to what a buck 50 produces. So the classic example is a buck 50 produces $10 million. You believe assessed value is going to increase by a per certain percentage, and you're going to put 10.5 million down in le the levy amount. Well, what happens is it only goes up half that. You can only collect 10.25. That amount is what you're going to be able to collect. I mean, b based on what 150 does, right? So it's 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 kind of a strange. It's a little backwards in what we used to do, right? You would you set the amount you need. And the rate was what it was, uh, depending on assessed value. Well, now you're you're locked in at a buck fifty, and then whatever that amount, whatever that rate produces in amount, based on your assessed value at the time of the levy, is what you're able to collect. So that's why districts are looking at well, being aggressive in their uh, analysis of how much to anticipate assessed value growth because they don't want to leave money on the table. Because remember, you cannot collect more than what the voters have approved. So you're always better aiming higher, and then, of course, it will just be rolled back. Uh, as it has in the past, uh, under the levy lid law, right, we have districts throughout the state that would uh, set a levy amount, and then when the application of the levy lid came along, 
they might not collect all that the voters had approved. So it's going to function the same way. In this instance, uh, at the time of the levy, uh, your amounts will be rolled back to what the current existing law is at the time. And right now, the law is $1.50. And so it doesn't matter what you honestly go out with at this point. Um, if, so for instance, the districts that went out in April, uh, some of them had $4.50, uh, others had a variety of other numbers. At the time when that, that levy is made in 2019, all those are going to be equalized to a buck fifty and whatever that produces in, in, in the collection amount. So that's how the landscape has changed. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, in our analysis, we've reviewed how the law is going to impact your ballot because we'd like to be able to make sure we can properly advise districts on what, what it means. And EHB 2242 did not change the form of the ballot. In fact, I think I mentioned that maybe even the last time I was here, that the law did not actually change what your ballot is going to look like, uh, with the exception of a couple items. One is we typically are seeing districts move away from the term maintenance because it's not entirely clear when you look at the information contained in, in the activities authorized uh, under the new law that maintenance of facility is actually included. Now, I could make an argument that it is. <coughs> I think a lot of districts are, are moving off that term because really what you're doing is you're funding educational programs and operation. And so even using the term maintenance in prior years is a little bit, it's not quite as accurate as what it could be. And I know a lot of your neighbors and other districts throughout the state have switched to using that terminology, educational programs and operation, or EPO levy. So that's something that, that will change. The other thing that we're doing, um, and fortunately in the Tri-Cities, you have uh, been a little bit on the cutting edge of how you've used language uh, for the ballot. Uh, generally, in your prior ballot, and I'll, I'll turn this on here just a second, but generally what you included was uh, essential uh, maintenance and operation expenses not funded by the state of Washington. Well, that's in, in essence a great uh, phraseology because that's exactly what you're doing. You are actually funding programs that are not funded by the state of Washington. And so um, that won't change in your ballot. What will change, however, is the argument that you could, that you, you'll put down $1.50 and you'll, whatever amount that produces, that's what you will include on the ballot. Uh, we do know there are districts throughout the state. There seems to be five or six different options that people are utilizing. Some are not changing what they've done at all and they're putting exactly what they levied previously and going out to the voters and explaining that uh, we need this, these dollars and if the law remains the same, then we'll have everything rolled back and just like we've done previously and that's how we'll, we'll handle it. Others are, are using any variation of that theme. Some are, are doing a little bit more than $1.50, others are doing less than $1.50. So it seems to be really all over the board and interestingly enough, we, we believe that the law allows that flexibility everything is going to be rolled back depending on when the law is applied to your levy collection. So it's a very fascinating um, uh, discussion. Uh, I wish it wasn't, it's a little bit too fascinating at this time of year, right, trying to get everyone on the ballot. But um, the other thing that we, we typically would not see, although nothing prevents you from describing this as an enrichment levy if you wanted to, but we believe that most districts are trying to stay as true or as close to their prior ballot as they've used before because they don't want to create a confusion in their voters. And that's, that's a real theme that we've tried to maintain whenever we've drafted uh, the prior maintenance operation levy ballots because we know that districts, they don't want their voters to be confused because um, it can happen easily and then now you've got a lot of uh, explaining to try to do to, to bring your constituency up to speed as far as what's happened. So staying as close to possible as your prior ballot is, 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 a, is a recommended approach. So. Is it, is it still called, we can still call it a replacement? Letter? Yes, yes. And, and, and part of the reason why you can call it a replacement is, is that actually you're still funding many of the same programs that you funded before. So hence you're still funding those same educational programs and operations that you did previously. You're just funding them at a, lo at a much lower level. And so we can still say that that's a replacement levy. We all we also will include some, some language uh, in, the, in the resolution. The resolution will look very similar. There's one piece that we will include in there, and that's, I think, important for you to, to know, is that there's a provision in the resolution that says that the exact levy rate under the old resolutions, the exact levy rate may be adjusted based on the actual assessed value at the time of the levy, which is exactly your point, where previously, uh, if assessed value went up, uh, you'd be able to collect a greater amount, but the taxpayers would actually pay less. 
because of the assessed value growth, and so your rate would, would moderate. Well, here, we've actually changed that to say your estimated rate and amount collected may be adjusted depending on uh, at the actual assessed value at the time you levy and also current law because we don't know, you know, you mentioned that it's really not, it, it hasn't really, um, this isn't really final. Well, it is final, but there's still so many pieces. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court argument was today on, on, the, on the legislation to see what's going to happen. Um, there's also discussion points surrounding uh, Governor Inslee having a, a special session sometime after the November 7th election. Um, so there's all sorts of rumors going about, and, and so I think everyone is very concerned, and that's why people are ha taking the position that, gee, we don't want to change because what happens if the law changed? Now, we, now we're stuck. So um, anyway, a lot of uncertainty, but the majority of districts that we're working with uh, are, are continuing to look at using $1.50, um, estimating a little higher on their assessed value growth, you know, taking whatever their highest assessed value has been over the last several years and maybe bumping that up a little bit just because of how, how assessed value has grown so much in each year. Um, and so that seems to be a reasonable approach that, that districts are taking. So, so th is it fair to say there's kind of two caps now? There's either the $1.50 or the nine point whatever, $9.4 million? Whichever is the lesser of those two is what we can collect. I, I think that's a that's a that's an accurate way of describing it. And if we're not able to collect the 9.4 million because we have a decrease in assessed value at this time, right. the state says they'll make up the difference between our 26 million dollar total. Right. You'll be at you'll be at let's say 9.2 in, in collecting that a dollar fifty would produce if you didn't if assessed value didn't grow as you expected or something less well, than. Our, but if our assessed in the example I used if our assessed value drops 30 percent and we can only collect six million, right now our understanding is that the state would make up the state would give us 20 million in LEA. Is that our understanding now? That would be the hope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It seems like that's where it's like this is final, but uh, we really, may go back yeah. and readjust because they may be like, well, we don't want to do that, right? Because that's not good budget on the state side. If we're going to just, they're going to just cover every district that has issues assess with their value. assessed value growth, right? So, it's yeah, it's frustrating. This is a little bit uh, uh, uncertain times right now, trying to, to navigate through these these questions. What I'd like to do is to show you. Um, I'm going to press this and see if it works. And what this is uh, just a markup. It's black line that will show what how we would uh, change the ballot. Uh, we, I think this is pretty consistent with what we're suggesting throughout the state. So again, you can see we place with expiring educational programs instead of maintenance. Um, and, and really, that is, in my view, if I'm a taxpayer, that's actually more accurate. I think we've gotten used to the notion of it being called a maintenance levy because that's what the constitute or that's what um, the statute called it. But there's nothing in the law that requires that you entitle it a maintenance levy. Just like there's nothing in the law that requires you to call it an enrichment levy. So um, we've seen some districts that call them uh, school programs in operation, or we have some that just call them uh, a local support levy. There's any number of ways to do it, but again, the goal is to try and not deviate from what your voters understand that, that they're seeing and what's consistent with your process. So you can see, um, then we go down to the kind of the change for essential educational programs and operation expenses. And then we've truncated after the state of Washington and, and deleted educational programs because you've already set it up above. And then uh, operations, you've already discussed operation expenses, so really you don't need to say that again. The only question that we have is, is that some districts might want to include some of those items that, that, that Howard mentioned. Uh, you know, do you want to include uh, staffing, extracurricular, special ed, all those kinds of things after the word state of Washington. I mean, you could put including uh, you know, staffing and, and student services. You could include that. Um, my concern has always been with the new law that um, in some respects, it may be better to be general as opposed to being too specific because someone could say, hey, I thought you were going to do, I thought this would cover uh, this type of staffing. And, and the way the law is written, there's a lot of hopes out there that it actually will give you what you need to function, right, to do facility maintenance and those kinds of things. But 
but the, the express terminology used in the statute isn't as clear with some of these items. So that's why we hedge a little bit, and, and I think the answer is that if you want to include that extra specificity, we certainly can, uh, but a lot of districts are trying to be uh, a little less specific and let um, let the district at some point in the future when you start needing to inform your voters what you're going to use those dollars for. You're going to have to describe what you're using the dollars for once you start your uh, voter information anyway. But I'm not sure, uh, number one, we do have a, a same, the same word limit right in the ballot, so we've got to be somewhat careful about how many words we include. But, but here, you certainly can include additional qualifiers if you'd like. So. Can, can we put words in, and maybe it's up here and I'm not seeing it, um, assuming that the the strikeouts aren't going to be there. I don't see anything that quantifies how much it's being reduced from the levy that it's replacing. Is there a way to add something in there? Generally, your category where you're, I mean, that's going to, right here's where it's going to be about 50, but we don't, we typically do not use some comparison saying this is less than. Can we, can we, or can we look at if there's a way to do that? Because I think if people can see that, and that's that's a pretty positive thing for some voters. What my concern would be is putting that in the ballot may be um, maybe challenging from a word limitation to describe that. I mean, it, we might be able to do it, but that might be one of the most important things to put in there. Well, so I think the place to put that would be in the voters' pamphlet or put right, it in that's, some district information. Right, that's would typically be nice if where you put that in there. Yeah, that's typically where you'd put it. Just like the description of the of the extra words, you know, educational, the student services or staffing. You can certainly include all those details and would would probably be wise to. Although the voters' pamphlet doesn't give us a whole lot of room, um, it's typically it will be in your voter information that goes out as where all the details you'll be able to describe those things. But we certainly can. I think. You know the description of of what your the description of how this has come about. I think is going to be uh, a challenging from a an, uh, a voter education standpoint. I think it's really going to be challenging to try to describe what's happened in the state law so that your voters understand when they see that ballot. And part of the reason why we didn't want to change too much of the ballot because we weren't sure, you know, how that message would be able to get across. Because there's obviously many voters that will get to the, they'll get their ballots and they won't have seen any other information from the district. So, um, but great point. Happy to look at, at seeing if there's a way yeah, of I carving it out. Mean, it seems it out. like if it doesn't make sense and and the district doesn't want to do it, that's fine. But if you could somehow say replacing the expiring levy of four dollars and twenty seven cents per thousand or whatever it is, whatever the right words are, I think that's if possible, it would be a good selling point. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, with the premise of what President Lerman is saying, you know, that w the message to our community is we have been the highest, you know, if not the highest, always at the top for years now. And so the message that we want everyone to understand is this is great for PASCO. The state is going to fund us better uh, and we're going to pay a lot less. And so that is a message that we that we want everyone to understand. I had a question since we brought up the pamphlet. From a legal standpoint, and maybe Ms. Thorne or someone have to step in here. What, from a legal standpoint, on the claims of a, of the voters' pamphlet, what are the rules guiding that? Because when there are things that are just clearly false, what what you know what reprieve is there for the other side to be like, well, whoa, that is absolutely false. There has to be some way to clear that up or force clearing up of those claims. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. The, there's, there's a couple of components to the to the voters pamphlet. One is, of course, you have to pro, appoint pro con committee members, which you've done over the last several elections. Uh, you also prepare the explanatory statement, which I think is it's like 75 words or 100 words. It's, you can barely describe what you want to do in the explanatory statement, and we end up preparing that for the district. Then um, the the pro con committees are the ones that actually prepare their individual statements. It's odd because. I don't think anyone is is fact checking or you know checking the veracity of some of the statements that are being made. So it really uh, involves the the pro committee or the con committee, depending on who you're who you're with, uh, further responding to that in rebuttal uh, to that information. And then it's a matter of uh, you know, she said he said, uh, and and there's really not a whole lot you can do. Uh, I suppose that if you 
could prove <coughs> some type of fraud, maybe you could get the, the auditor to, to remove it, but boy, that, I think that's a pretty tough standard. Yeah, it's just because this is, that's what most people look at, right? You get that and you go online or get the pamphlet and you, I mean, I certainly have done that and then people I talk to, they look at people's statements, they want to just see what they're claiming, they want to see what, whether it's candidates or measures, you know, what are people saying? So if you have absolutely fraudulent claims in there that a majority right. of people we would assume look at as one of the first things that you're going to look at in deciding to support a measure or not. It seems like there should be some uh, some way to address right. and, completely and, false claims. Right, and the mechanism would be to have the pro co committee do that if, if it's the con committee or vice versa because as a school board and a district you have to stay out of that fray, <clears throat> right? Otherwise because you can't use your public resources up to promote That's on our personal measure. time, right? If exactly. we want to go, so, if I see that this is fraudulent, I know I can't do it on my school board time resources, but I'm going to go and fight this, but I could do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and it may be as easy, well, I won't say easy, but it may be uh, a, the best approach might be to approach the auditor and say, look, this information is fraudulent, and here's our information that shows that this is just not true. <coughs> and maybe allow them to, to, to edit that information. But their rules are pretty loose as far as, you know, you submit the information, they're not going in and looking behind what, what you said. So, and Sarah, is that consistent with? Okay, thank so you. So, I wish it was different, but, and it'd be great if they could actually give us, in the explanatory statement, a little bit more room to describe what's happening, but they haven't done that yet, so. So, yeah, again, we've had some emails from community members, like Mr. Richardson says, saying, we're going to have a windfall. I think people that just look at Mr. Robert's presentation might look at that, like Mr. Richardson said, and say, whoa, $24 million more than you had previously. Go use that money. Tighten your belt and go use it to build. Fact check, no, we can't use that money to build. But we still really don't know everything that we can use that money for, right? We don't know the full details of it right now. So as a board and as a district, we're talking about $1.50 per thousand of assessed value sounds like a good idea. If when we full better understand this, we decide we don't need that full $1.50 per thousand and we don't need the corresponding matching funds from the state, and the board, whoever's on the board at that time decides when we fully understand this, that we only need a dollar thirty or a dollar forty per thousand. What does it take? What does the board what would the board do to lower that amount? We're allowed to collect a dollar fifty. We say we don't need to. We're gonna give some money back to the community. What do we do at that point? Right. I, a fairly simple process. It's it's just like you would if if you had reached your levy lid, uh, you would just certify a lower amount in your budget. So it's it and you can you, you can make it a, a formal action item if you want to a, a, a motion, but but really the function is all you're going to be doing is you're going to be collecting you're going to be certifying a lower amount for collection for that year, and that's that's what we mean by by rolling it back in essence. So still so running dollar fifty right now gives us the most flexibility, but we have a year a little over a year until we actually get this money from from 2019 to to understand the impacts of house bill 2242 and the color of money and how we can use money so at that point the board can reassess and right. and lower if they chose to yeah i think so the point you made earlier uh, about talking about the communication with the community i see that th that's a key to me if we look at what we've just been discussing and kind of that chart that mr roberts had which i think was excellent showing kind of the differences of how you approach it no one wants to feel nickel and dimed. So to me, a clear message that's easily understandable, even if we were a couple hundred thousand dollars off and had to adjust our budget, that is more valuable to me than figuring out every way to make sure we get every penny of that levy amount, if that makes sense. Right, so yes. I'm much more in favor of a very clear, easily explained, under understandable amount that everyone is, is, is clear about than trying to figure out that just trick to make sure that we get that maximum 26.7 and not 26.5 or, you know what I mean? It's and Howard's presentation was very clear <coughs> and it's, I think it, I think if you can use that information to then communicate, that will be, that will be very effective. The other concern addressing the question regarding the four year versus the two year, it's, it really depends on how, what your level of comfort is as far as, and, and honestly what we believe the law will do in two years. I mean, this is a somewhat of a trial run as far as how this will be 
um, effectuated. And so it could be that a two-year levy is what you've done in the past is not a bad idea in the sense that, that uh, you know, at that time period, yes, you'll be going back to the voters in two years, but you've been doing that for a number of, of cycles. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, one could argue, well, four years is great because you don't have to go out and get pre-ballot approval for your, your, your next levy, you can, uh, which is required by OSPI for levies commencing after, uh, in, commencing with January 1 of 2019. All levies after that will have to get pre-ballot approval uh, of your expenditure plan. So OSPI is going to have to approve what you're spending those dollars on. Um, and so if you went with a four-year, you wouldn't have to worry about that, that piece to it. Um, so I think there's pros and cons either way as far as, as, far as running either a two or four year. And it's, it, the, the other downside to possibly a four year would be, well, if the law does change, now you're locked in to a buck 50. But I, I believe that even if you were, and the legislature changed it for some reason, they would give you an out to be able to run a supplemental levy to be able to pick up whatever else that they might have authorized. So yeah, it'd be unfair for them to change the rules and then say, "But we're holding you to them, right?" Yeah. Right. So I, I'll just state right off the bat: in general, I love the pro and con you just gave. I would be in favor of a longer le a four year, on the main reason that I hear from a lot of people that they're sick of facing so many ballot measures. So if nothing else, to increase our community rapport and show that we're listening. Even if it means that we don't get quite as much money, which is great, right? Because that's less that they're paying and not having to face a ballot measure, whether a bond or a levy, so frequently, that would be a big plus in my mind and worth giving up a little bit of, of money. Well, there are a lot of districts that are doing that, uh, going to a four-year cycle. So, Another question. Um, we've also had comments from the community why do you have to run a levy in February for something that's not going to kick in um, for another 10 plus months? Are the majority, can, can you give me a feel on what right. most school districts do? Is Do most of them run it in February? Most, or are we, most districts do run in February, uh, and there's a couple, there's, there's several reasons for doing that. One is that's traditionally when uh, districts have run their levies is February. April is tough because um, tax statements come out and then you're also getting ready for uh, any RIF notices that you might have to give in the 1st of May. So you're, you're up against that deadline. You might not have your results in time to be able to know whether you're going to be able to, to continue to function or whether you'll have to rerun the election. Most districts believe that if they, they run in February also because they, it gives them a second bite of the apple, you can run twice in a calendar year for a levy and that gives them a chance to go in, fe in April instead of having to run in April and then running again in August or November. Uh, there are districts that run in November but not November before the collection year. So in other words, there are districts that would have run in November of 16 for collection in commencing in 19. They'll go out actually a full year in advance uh, and the notion being that they can certainly do that and some districts do that because they want to take advantage of the cost savings they have by running in November. Um, but not in the calendar, not right before the calendar year is going right, to start. Right, but the, but the preceding year. So again, there is, so everyone else is running this February. Some districts ran in November of last year. The dilemma is, is under state law, you have to certify your taxes for collection within a year of that November election date. And so, so you have to be on top of your levy certifications because if you exceed that one year duration, you might not be able to collect your taxes. So it's, there's, it's a little tricky if you go out a year in advance uh, in that November date. Now, if you were to go out in November of 18 for collection starting in 19, a couple things to think about. One would be is if you fail, you've got no recourse. You're going to lose a full complete collection year in 2019. There's no second option to, to run to be able to collect it uh, in 2019. So a lot of districts shy away from November as their first uh, time to run their ballots because of that fear. So, any other questions from the board? You know, I'm. St I don't know if I'm alone in this, but this I, I read through all of this before I came. I'm reading it now. I still, I don't have a complete grasp on this by any means. So right now we're trying to decide what level of levy to run when we don't even know for sure what that is going to bring us, and we're even considering doing it for four years. Um, so, Amy, just to 
the intention of tonight was the first of two study sessions, okay. recognizing that it's a very complex issue. And so, you know, certainly I didn't mean to interrupt and whatever you feel like you need to continue. We have another study session scheduled for at our next board meeting and as district staff, we would be happy to spend as much time with individual board members or board members in pairs as necessary to understand the depth of the information. And then um, at the next board meeting, should the board be in a place of understanding where they felt like they could take action, mm -hmm. that would be ideal given the timeline. However, there is a tiny bit of slide built into the schedule. So if we had to slide action one more meeting, we could, it'll be tight. But we definitely want you to feel like you have as much information as possible and a deep level of understanding of the information before required to make a decision. And this shows, you know, I, I'm looking at a slide that has 2017 change in state local funding. Right now we're collecting 25 million and it goes up by about $800,000 every year. So <clears throat> I anticipate if we went out for a levy, we would be trying <clears throat> to collect approximately 26 million. Well, this shows in 2021 that we are going to get 24,609. To me, that looks less, but is that in addition to the 26 million that we would have collected on our own? Well, we're, we're not going to try and collect 26 million. We're only going to collect, fit be, our total would be 26 million, and that includes right. the state portion. We'd only be able to collect $1.50 per thousand. I know we can only, but I'm saying that's what we're collecting right now. I don't see the $24 million increase in our funding, but that's for sure what we're getting is $24 million increase in our funding beyond what we are currently getting. Beyond what we are currently by 2021. By 2021. Comparing if that bill would have not been in place versus what it's in, a, in place that particular year, yes. And you can see that includes 15 million loss and levy and local and things. And that's, <laughs> that's all, the, the assumption is that we would do $1.50. I mean, OSPI just did that. You're gonna do the $1.50 max. So they took the maximum we could get and still you're gonna have a decrease there. But you're going to have more your, than your that. decrease in your local oh, levy, yes. but a net increase in your overall funding. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Miss Phillips. I think what helped me with this was I made a chart that to separate out local levy, levy equalization. What's the new term? Levy. Yeah. Local what, effort what, assistance. Was it local, local effort, effort assistance? So, local money, state money, and then this is I, I, I view separately because it's it's the state funding us more for salaries and costs. So I, to me, that needs to be a separate thing, and then we can combine them. And then that shows, then I looked over year to year. That shows what our local amount changes, our state donation, our state portion changes, and then this additional funding that they've decided to give us is kind of another separate category. And then you can separate those three and compare year to year. But I got the same confusion. I'm like, okay, wait a second. Because they're giving this extra money, extra funding, which we've been saying they've been needing to do for years. And so let's view that separately than our levy. So it's kind of a separate thing in my mind. And if we're, tr I, I'm struggling too with the fact we're truly getting 20, by 2021, we're getting $25 million extra. Next year we'll get $8 million extra. I realize there's pockets where that money has to go. There's new programs that we have to put into place. I, I'd really like to see that subtracted out and the money that we have control over. If they're giving us more money to compensate our teachers, we have taken a huge hit in our district. Every single you know, area in our district has had to make cuts for, for that funding. We'll be able to reinstate some of those funds, um, you know, I, I want to know where this money is going because I don't want to collect more from the taxpayers than we have to. So I realize we can go back and change that, but whoever does that, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned. I want to be really respectful of the money that has been entrusted to us. So I need more information, yet it sounds like we might not even have it because we don't know exactly what the state's going to do. Part of the problem is what is enrichment. <laughs> That's, that's so, part of the problem. Can you go down two slides? This one? Well, it's, no. I'm not <laughs> sure which one it is then. It was two slides after that on our 
So where you were, it's the one that's you got non-exhaustive potential uses oh, for yeah, enrichment. Yeah, right here. Thank you. So what can can is this over and above what we're paying now? No, no, because we're already doing okay. a lot. We're of this. we're already doing this with our maintenance and operations levy. Yeah. Okay. So this is not intended to align with this 24 million. So so this really is. I mean, next year we're going to get eight million extra dollars. It's next year eight million, no matter what we do. Going up to the previous slide. Well, uh, assuming that our funding formulas and the model we've used are accurate, we will have an an additional eight million dollars of revenue next year. I'm Actually, I guess that's this year. Yeah, this, this year. year. Yeah, and we do have that for this year. We we already do have that. That's in our budget. So, another. And a, oh, sorry, Mr. So this is, uh, yeah. So assuming that our expenses climb at that rate, then we would be we would be justified in collecting a um, dollar fifty. But I, I'm I'm with Mrs. Phillips. If we don't want to just say, well, we can get twenty four million. Let's get twenty four million. If we don't have a, a a need for that, then we need to be uh, mindful of the taxpayers paying that money. So that's where I that's where I think this is a little bit. We've got to know what we're going to do with that money, not just collect it because we can. Yeah, I agree. How, how many employees does the Pasco School District have today, roughly? Total. Any? Approximately twenty two hundred. Okay, twenty two hundred. And that that's certificated and, and classified. Everything. So if, if we look at the slide where you said the state was going to fund and then establish these new boxes of, of funded 52,000 52, to 60,000, 60, whatever that one was. Yeah, so right there. So, so they're going to, the state is trying to say, you know, we realize that we're going to just pay more and have it be more equal. And, and if obviously our, whether whatever you think about teacher salary, the fact is there's a teacher shortage, and so there, the demand, the supply and demand phenomenon. That if you they need to be paid more, right? If 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 you have if we had an abundance of you know five thousand extra teachers in our state, and you know there's not quite the there wouldn't be quite the demand, but we have a massive shortage, where we have numerous teachers in pretty much every district that are not quite certificated, but that are working on that. So the state is going to increase the funding. Can you go back to the slide, the one that we had been on with the... So one thing that helps me um, with this extra money, so if you look at just the top one, compensation related, so we look back at that the state is trying to pay everyone better, and then we look at the compensation related. From this year, it goes from $3 million to $12 million to twenty four. So in the next two years, that's where the that's where I mean these are not all the same thing, but that's an extra twenty one million dollars. We're having an extra twenty four million. So that if that if this all goes how they're saying, that's twenty one million dollars. And like President Lambert pointed out earlier, trying to calculate, okay, they're saying that we have to instead of giving us fifty two, we're going to get sixty two, and that with twenty two hundred employees adds up real quick, and that's where a lot of that goes. Um, so I think that's the main effort is that they're saying we're not funding education adequately in the state. We don't pay. They pay whatever amount for teachers. And so local communities have been paying extra to be able to get attract teachers. If we pay 40000 and the other local districts pay 50000 for a new teacher, whatever it is, then we're not going to get any teachers. No one's going to work for us. So that's they're trying to equalize that model, and that's where the majority of that funding is going. And then obviously the programs that we've talked about. But I, I totally agree. If we're not just going to ask for money with Without a plan to use it, uh, the money and there the state's not going to give it to us either. We have to know where this is going, and we should have the same transparency and planning with our the local money. The one thing that I don't like is how they the money sometimes gets pushed together. So I've asked in the past years ago, even before I was on the board. Okay, well, where did that money go? But it gets rolled in sometimes to the general fund, and that's frustrating because okay, we got this 10 million local money for the levy. Show me where it all went. And that's hard to do. And that's frustrating to me and the community because you can't say, well, this went to this program and this because it gets rolled in more to your 
general fund often, even though that you still have to report certain things. That right. makes well, the, a lot of it. And the new law also has accountability requirements for the state auditor's office as well as OSPI to track. You know, you now have to, uh, starting um, in 2020, I believe, you have to start depositing those dollars for, that you've received from your levy into a sub fund created within the general fund so that you can track those dollars and expenditures. And of course, that will make it easier for the auditor to track what you're spending the dollars on as well as the district. So, tell you. That's good. Yeah. So, so, that, so actually, that, that we'll issue will be addressed uh, right. specifically. I think what Howard is, and, and I really sympathize with, your, with, with the concern over just, uh, it is really confusing. And <laughs> we've spent months trying to, to just analyze some of the legal issues related to this law. And uh, quite frankly, we've gone in circles. Uh, much of the time we've been looking at it. So I uh, don't feel bad because it is, it's extremely confusing. But I do think that, that what will, the hardest part to this process is, as Howard indicated, what is going to be considered enrichment. And so you've got to know what will be authorized in order for you to be able to figure out how to spend it. And I think that's a little bit slow in coming from OSPI. They're supposed to give us some direction and that direction is coming slower than, than I think people would like. It's interesting because remember originally when the law came out, they said, well, you've got to get pre-ballot approval for your expenditure plan. You've got to, OSPI has to approve your plan this year because you're going to the voters to start collecting taxes in, in, uh, in 2019, so therefore you're going to have to, have to get this pre-ballot approval. Well, OSPI came back and said, whoa, wait a minute. We're, <laughs> this law isn't effective until January 1 of 19, so therefore we don't need to start doing pre-ballot approval because we don't have a mechanism in place to do it. So they're just not equipped yet to really be able to analyze and approve an expenditure plan. So I expect that to change, but still it's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty related to those expenditures. Yeah, I hope you're right that the transparency is going to increase. This is a simple analogy in my head that, that how people get around this, like this whole Planned Parenthood argument. So let's say we give Planned Parenthood $10 million in funding and they perform $10 million worth of abortions in a year, but they also have $20 million of revenue from their other birth control services. So some people would say, well, we're just funded your abortions with our donations, but then other people would say, well, no, we didn't use that money for that. We use that to pay for the other birth control options. So do you see how it gets dicey? Saying where money went is, is tricky because they got money and maybe they assign that to the other options even though it's the amount that was used, or you know, it's the same amount. And so that's where it gets tricky saying, well, where did money go? Uh, and you could assign it as an organization unless there are stipulations, however you want. So. so I think one of the things that would be helpful is if we know, and this is, this is part of the challenge now, because we're using local money to pay for so many other things that the state will fund. But under the definition of the new law of those things that can be, in funded, can be funded with this enrichment levy, how much of that, or how much is that currently? And I think uh, that would then help us understand, and I'm not asking for that tonight, but anyway, if we, at some point we need to know, is that $1.50 of, of our assessed value, or is that a dollar? Is it 75 cents? Is it something other than that? Not to say that we couldn't increase it from that, because I think there's things that we we could use it for um, th that we're not doing right now. But anyway, I think that information would be helpful. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Um, we will digest this, and, and uh, Ms. Phillips and I and Ms. Whitney will figure out how we'll uh, move forward in talking about it at the next board meeting. Uh, please join us at our regularly scheduled board meeting at 6.30.